Day 301 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoe. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Well, I am back at home. I had a really wonderful time with Holly, and thank you so much for bearing with us as we had some audio issues. And of course, we were like, you know what? We're not going to let this keep us from getting God's Word out there. Jesus preached from a boat and from a mountain, and I'm sure that people were not complaining about the lack of perfect acoustics, so we appreciate your grace in that. But hopefully everything's working as it is supposed to because I had to reconnect all of my audio and my cameras. So Jesus, please help us give us technological mercies. And I also want to thank you guys so much for encouraging Holly and me and allowing us to show you the power of doing life together in fellowship and reading God's word together. That it really is our goal here. And we are working on some things to be able to help train others to be able to do the same thing that we're doing here, not necessarily on YouTube, but just in general, you know, making disciples. So we're really excited about that. We feel like the Holy Spirit really dropped a big love note to us uh, over the past weekend, filled up our tanks to be able to continue doing what we are doing. So thank you for that. So as we continue with 64 days left in this year of reading God's Word and finishing it up, if you could please help us out by hitting the thumbs up button, that is your roll call button, letting us know that you are partnered with us, telling you to and please spread the word, YouTube. If you're new to this Bible study, please let us know in the comments where you're watching from, how you found us, and please make sure to check out the show notes or description box for all of the info that you need about this Bible study, or you can always go to our website, heartdive.org. Don't forget about the extra resources that we have to offer you, which is our written prayers, summaries of the chapters that we are reading, and also a written out version of all of the heart checks that we provide for each video. You can grab those for either a dollar a day or $20 a month. It is a bundle package that we offer to you. And if you want to join us in deeper fellowship and being a part of our community, you can do so on Facebook. We do have the link in the description box below. So today we are in Luke chapters 16 and 17, Jesus now addressing his disciples, no longer addressing the multitudes of people. And so this is a bit more pointed in his messaging, talking about some money matters. You know, that's something that Jesus talked more about than anything else. So we're going to get into that. But before we do so, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we honor you. We glorify you. You, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, God, and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We surrender our lives to you, and that is indeed what we want. We want your will because we know that it is good, that it is perfect, that it is for our benefit, and that it is not for our destruction. It is beautiful. And us seeing a glimpse of what that purpose and that will is here on earth is a glimpse into heaven. So we thank you for opening those windows today, letting us just see a little bit of it. I pray that you'll open up our eyes to see it, our ears to hear it, and our hearts to receive what you are doing and what you are wanting to speak to our hearts today. Please forgive us for our sins, Lord. Clear out anything that is holding us captive, keeping us from being able to hear your voice and keeping us from being able to be in fellowship with you. Help us to also forgive others, to set them free. And please don't lead us into temptation. We know the enemy wants to do his thing, but will you guard us, protect us, Lord. Protect our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we start off here with the parable of the dishonest manager. So Jesus also said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, or your translation might read steward. So this would be a person who would manage the entire estate of a rich person. And charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, well, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, you know what? Take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. So he is reducing the amount that this debtor owes. And then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. So he said to him, take your bill and write 80. Now the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. So he's not condoning his conduct, but he does appreciate the way that he has used his power and his authority to be able to make things right and to make good. And 
He is called the dishonest manager, but some of the ways that he could have been reducing this bill for these debtors is that he could have just simply been using his authority to say, you know what, I'm going to reduce your bill. Or he could have removed the interest, the amount of interest that they would typically charge, or the steward may have actually removed his commission so that these men could just pay whatever was owed to the master. So Jesus is telling the apostles here, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwelling. So on the practical side of things, we can look at things like stewardship, you know, management of money. And so when I look at that, I think about the fact that I kind of grew up watching my daddy buy weekly lottery tickets. And every single week, according to the Powerball amount, he would actually write out this detailed ledger of what he was going to do with the millions of dollars. So he would give X amount to the church, and he would give an amount to each of his daughters. And then he had an amount that was allotted for our new house, our new car, and all kinds of other material things. And he really truly believed up until his dying day, that winning the lottery was his ticket to security and happiness. And this is the mentality a lot of us live under, you know, if we just have more, then we can help others. Or until we get the raise or win the lottery, we are strapped and therefore we have nothing else to give. But if you think about it, it really is relative. You know, the money is not the agent of the change in our behavior or in our hearts. I mean, if we are not operating in integrity and generosity with what we have now in our possession, what's going to change if we get more? And that is what Jesus is saying here. And just as this steward was expected to give an account for how he handled what he was given, so will we one day at the Bema Seat of Christ for everything, whether that's our gifts, our talents, money, whatever. So heart check, have you been faithful in stewarding what God has given you? And how are you spending your time, your talents, treasure, and your influence? So Jesus continues here in verse 10, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, which this is just calling it unrighteous because he is pointing out here how the love of money can indeed lead to unrighteous behavior. It can lead to selfishness. So if you've not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So if we zoom out a little bit here and we look at the spiritual implication, Jesus is trying to get them to look beyond the wealth of the world and to have an eternal perspective of what true wealth is. But if we cannot even handle or manage our money here on earth, why in the world would he trust us with even greater riches in heaven or even here on earth with greater influence or greater responsibility? And whenever I look back on my life, the way that I managed and stewarded my money, it directly aligned with the way that I lived spiritually. Whenever I was reckless in my checkbook and in debt, I was also recklessly living. My behavior was reckless. And honestly, today I can confidently say that I have a lot more responsibility when it comes to handling finances. And my husband has actually given me full control of our finances because so, whereas he didn't trust me for a good 10 years in our marriage. And my spiritual discipline reflects that. Now, I don't know what came first, whether it was the chicken or the egg, right? Like, I don't know if it was my spiritual discipline first versus financial responsibility first, but either way, it goes hand in hand. And Jesus says so. So once we truly understand that God owns everything and we're just managers of it, we will begin to look at money differently and we will allow it to serve us rather than us being a slave to it. And contrary to what many believe, you do not have to be rich to be a slave to money. So heart check. Does money have a hold on you? How much do you sacrifice to make more money? And if you were faced with serving the Lord or making a buck, which would you choose? And so we see this idea here that 
If you are just a little bit selfish, you're going to be big time selfish. Whereas if you are generous with the little, you will be generous with the much. Verse 14. Now, the Pharisees who were lovers of money, so they were covetous, you know, they were always wanting more. That's what that lover of money is. You're always seeking more, more, more heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So obviously God has a whole different value system than the world does. The world will judge us by the amount of stuff that we have or our wealth or our influence. Whereas God is like, no, no, I'm looking at the heart. I'm looking at the inside of a person. I don't care whether or not they are rich or successful or influential. I'm looking at how they treat people, how they love people, how they shine righteousness and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and how they are a light to the world. Verse 16. Now the law and the prophets were until John, meaning John the Baptist. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. So basically, the Old Testament was all about the law. It was all about the prophets. It was all about the old covenant up until John the Baptist. And once he entered the scene, then we saw the formation of the new covenant and the gospel. And now everyone who is receptive of it will be zealous and passionate and will make a great effort to be able to get into that new covenant. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. So this new covenant does not get rid of the law. What it does is it fulfills the law and it confirms how that old covenant pointed to the new covenant. Verse 10, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. And remember, this is not perpetual adultery that you will be living in. This is a commission of adultery. It is a sin if it is not done so on biblical grounds. But I believe the reason why he brought this up, because it seems to have come out of nowhere, is because he's talking about the importance of commitment. Because remember, our life with Jesus, it is like a marriage. You know, he is the bridegroom. We are the bride. Commitment matters. So I believe he is bringing them back to this earthly covenant that we make because he was always looking for ways to relate the kingdom to something here on earth so that they could understand it. Verse 19, now there was a rich man who was clothed in purple, which of course, purple was an expensive dye at that time. So he's clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. So because this is actually about a person who is named, this is not a parable. This is an actual case that Jesus is referring to, something that really happened. And this man who is poor laying at the gate, clearly the man who is eating sumptuously every single day, the rich man, is passing by him every single day. So treating him with contempt, ignoring him, overlooking him, doesn't care about him, zero compassion. And every time I used to read this as a child, I used to have this picture of this poor man sitting on the rich man's floor at the base of his table. And it never made sense to me. Now I know what this means because in this day, rich men or rich people, they would eat with their hands and they would wipe their hands on loaves of bread or pieces of bread. Like that was their bounty paper towel. (laughs) There were no paper towels back then. So they would wipe it on bread and then this bread would get discarded. And so then the poor people would eat that bread. That's what it means that uh, he would eat the crumbs that fell from their table. So moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried by the angel to Abraham's side. So clearly he was not honored in a proper burial, but we see this angelic escort into the afterlife, into Abraham's bosom, which is known as paradise. We've talked about this before. So in Hades, there was known to be two sections. One side was Abraham's bosom. This was known as paradise or a place where the righteous were held until Jesus goes to the cross, comes and preaches to them and is able to take the righteous up to heaven with him. The other side being the place of torment, which is the whole area until the great judgment. So Lazarus goes to Abraham's side, the righteous side, whereas the rich man, verse 22, 
also died and was buried, so he got the proper burial, honored on earth, and in Hades, being in torment, so he's on the side of torment, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So this tells us that in the afterlife, there will be recognition of people that you know. And he called out, Father Abraham. So this tells us that this rich man was a descendant of Abraham. Have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am a man in anguish in this flame. So he's still looking at Lazarus as some sort of servant, which goes to show his character here. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. So this is a model result of Matthew 7, 1 and Luke 6, 38 that says, with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I mean, the rich man and Lazarus are both receiving their payment for the way that they treated others or for the way that they lived while they were on earth. So the rich man, again, had no compassion and therefore he receives no compassion, right? But then Lazarus, he is comforted here. He's receiving the kingdom of heaven because he mourned while he was on earth and he was poor in spirit. Remember the Beatitudes? So heart check, what will your paycheck in the afterlife be like? How much do you consider your daily actions and their eternal effects? Verse 26, and besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. So he is saying, there's a divide here. Rich man, you cannot come over to this side. So that tells us that we need to get our stuff right while we're here on earth. Like our fate is sealed once we cross over to the other side. Verse 27, and he said, then I beg you. Isn't that interesting? The role reversal here, Lazarus was the beggar on earth. Now he's the beggar in Hades. Father, to send him to my father's house for I have five brothers. So this also tells us that in the afterlife, we will have a consciousness of those who are still on earth so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So it's almost as if he is implying that he didn't get a good enough warning. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. So he's here thinking that surely if they see someone rise from the dead, which hello, Jesus will and Lazarus will, and that's not going to help, doesn't change anything. But But verse 31, he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So he is saying, I'm sorry, personal responsibility here. You know, you knew what the law said. You knew what the prophets spoke and they do too. They don't get special treatment and some sort of message that they need to repent somehow. They have been clearly told and they're not listening the same way that the rich man didn't. Chapter 17, and he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So everybody's going to be tempted. There's going to be offense, whether it is offense that comes from someone or offense that comes from truth here. And while Jesus is commanding rebuke, this is not for the sake of revealing every single record of wrong or confronting every petty offense. This is seeing a destructive offense and being able to confront it with both truth and mercy. You see, Jesus links that kind of rebuke directly with forgiveness. In other words, rebuke should always be done with a heart that is ready to forgive and a heart that is ready to restore that person or help to restore them back to God and back to people. So if you cannot do that and you're only rebuking or correcting people for the sake of just making them feel bad and letting them know that they did wrong, it is not being done in the way that Jesus says, and it will be rendered ineffective. So heart check, how do you approach rebuke? Do you speak truth in love? Are you ready to forgive and help that person find restoration? So this is not condemnation and judgment. Like we're not telling them you're going to go to hell or 
you deserve this and that. This is saying, hey, you know what? This really hurt my heart or I see what you're doing and you're not headed down a good road. Let me help you. Like, what can I do? Have I hurt you? You know, again, he said, pay attention to yourself. Like, look within first before you try to go to someone and rebuke them. Verse five, now the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith because they're sitting here saying, man, if you need us to forgive people, it's going to take a lot of faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be up uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. So of course, Jesus is talking about radical forgiveness and the apostles are like, well, we need radical amount of faith. And he uses this illustration of the mulberry tree because mulberry trees are exceptionally strong and they have these deep root systems, ones that will make a tree last like 600 years. So Jesus is telling them that even the smallest amount of faith could uproot these kinds of trees. And so if we think about that spiritually, We may have circuits of strongholds in our root system, you know, and it could be things like bitterness, it could be unforgiveness, it could be anger. And a lot of us will say things like, well, that's just the way that I am. That's the way that God built me. Or we will pull out the victim card and say, well, you don't know what I went through. Now, I am not dismissing hardships and what people have gone through, because I've gone through a whole lot. But we have the authority to uproot the things that are destructive, like behaviors and things that shouldn't be in our hearts that might be strangling us. And while we may think that we need more faith to do that, Jesus is saying, you don't need more faith. You just need to unleash the faith that is already in your heart so that you can rip these issues out of the root. So heart check. Are there any strongholds in your root system that need to be uprooted? Verse 7, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep, which if anybody's ever done plowing or sheep keeping, is not easy work, it's hard work, say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at a table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Now, I don't know how you all grew up, but I never got paid (laughs) for doing chores. And whenever my parents told me to clean my room or to dust or clean the toilet, I didn't get a gold star for doing what I was told to do. It was just expected of me. And therefore, I never expected an additional reward. And I have since then learned that the reward for doing the chores is that it teaches responsibility and stewardship, which is far greater than a couple of dollars, you know, that we could ever make. And it's the same way that serving Jesus can be hard work and we can easily feel as though we somehow deserve something whenever we do what he says to do. And while he will reward us for the chores that we do, we should never expect it. Because if you think about it, he's already done so much for us, you know, way more than we could ever deserve. And he doesn't owe us anything. So serving him is actually a sacred honor, not a duty. It's a chance to be able to share what he has done and to share his great love. So heart check, are you looking for a reward when you serve the Lord? Or do you see it as a privilege or honor? Verse 11, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. So notice that he did not heal them. He told them, go do this first, like go to the priest and let him confirm that you are healed. So they didn't get to see the miracle of healing before their obedience. They had to be obedient first and start walking toward the miracle before they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus's feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan, which is pretty interesting that it was the Samaritan, the half-breed, the ones that were despised by the Jews, who turned around with gratitude and worshiped him and thanked him and had that heart of gratitude toward him. And then Jesus answered, were not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, 
Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, you may be asking, well, I thought they were cleansed already. I thought they were healed. Well, this is likely speaking of now he was made whole spiritually as well as physically. Verse 20, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, or in other words, that cannot be observed by these hostile and doubtful eyes, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So, Jesus is saying, as much as you think that it's going to be this way and that way, the kingdom of God is right here. I am here now. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So this is speaking of false messiahs or false teachers trying to say Jesus is here or Jesus has already come. I've heard that argument too. But Jesus is like, no, no, no. There's going to be no mistaking it. You are going to know that I'm here. No one's even going to have to tell you. But first, he must suffer many things, must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So it's going to be like the days of Noah in the sense that it is just normal life. Everybody is just business as usual. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be calamity because we know that in the end days, there is major chaos and it's crazy and it could even be during the tribulation, but it just means that people are living as normal. They're coming and going, they're getting married, they're going to work. And not only that, but it is also going to be a time of total judgment. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now on that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. So he's saying, don't look back on what once was. When that day comes, you go. Full surrender, all in, no pass and go, no collecting $200. Get to Jesus. Focus on eternity. But if you are more concerned about this life than you are about getting to heaven, you may lose your chance in that day to be taken up. Verse 34, I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. Again, this is giving us that picture of it's going to be normal life. One will be taken and the other left. Now, this is not saying that every single couple, there's going to be one who's gone and one who is left, where everybody's going to wake up and their partner was raptured. But it's just saying that there will be situations like this. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? And he said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So, of course, most scholars apply this to what we believe to be the rapture. And the fact that he is going to come suddenly and he's going to come unexpectedly, it could happen in the middle of the night, it could happen in broad daylight while people are sleeping, while people are working. But it's going to be swift, it's going to be sudden, and those who know him, there's going to be no mistaking that it is indeed him. And this last line here is a little bit puzzling, but I believe he is saying, when the judgment is ripe, it is surely going to come. And those who are spiritually dead there are going to be vultures in plain sight, and you will see the signs if you are spiritually awake. So taking a look at some of our deep dive questions, why did Jesus preach so much about money? What does stewardship of wealth look like in practical ways? How can we be better stewards? How do we reconcile financial responsibility with trusting in the Lord for provision? Are they exclusive of one another? Where do you see evidence or results of small faith? How big of a role does gratitude play in our faith? How can we be more mindful to express our gratitude to God and others? And how are you preparing for the return of Jesus? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for reminding us of what we should be valuing while here on this earth. 
We want to look beyond what is here, Lord, and gain an eternal perspective so that we do not get bogged down by trying to make it. But we also do want to be faithful in stewarding the gifts and the talents, the relationships, the treasures, anything that you've given to us to manage. Will you help us to see how we can intentionally use what we have to honor you and also to be a blessing to others? May we see beyond earthly wealth, knowing that our true treasure is found in you. And keep our hearts far from greed, God, and distraction as well, for we know that we cannot serve both you and money. And if money is in any way holding us captive, please break those chains off of us and help us to trust in you as our provider. God, I pray that we will understand our place as managers so that you can entrust us with spiritual wealth. And may we never think that what we do is too small for every deed and thought is valuable to your heart. And I pray that we will not be like the rich man who lacked compassion and overlooked those in need. We know that the measure we use here on earth will be measured back to us, both in the good and the bad. So I pray that we will be mindful of this in our daily walk, knowing that our actions will echo in heaven. And thank you, Lord, for the way that you continue to forgive us over and over. I pray that we will also be quick to forgive others. Help us to release petty offenses or any resentment that we may be holding or harboring in our hearts. And please increase compassion and humility so that we will first look within and then be able to approach others who hurt us with both truth and love. I pray that we will do so with a heart that seeks to restore them. We know that in doing this, we will receive both healing and peace. And please strengthen our small seeds of faith. Help us to trust that even the littlest faith can accomplish great things and uproot strongholds. I pray that we will rely on you in all things, knowing that you are working them for our good. And we thank you for everything that you have done for us, God. I pray that we never take this for granted and that we always have hearts full of gratitude. May we see this life in service to you as a sacred honor and a privilege. You have done so much for us and it is more than we could ever deserve. I pray that in serving you, it will never feel like a task to be completed, but rather an opportunity to partner with you in meaningful ways. And in doing that, we will be drawn closer to your heart and your purpose. And please help us to walk in faith before the miracle. Each step we take in obedience to your word, we know that our eyes will be open to even more of your goodness. And as we walk out this life, Lord, please prepare our hearts for your return. And may we be watchful of the signs so that we are not caught off guard. Help us not to fall into complacency, but rather be diligent in seeking you daily so that we do not miss a single sign. Fill our hearts with hope as we wait upon you. We mount up with wings like eagles. We will run and not be weary, and we will walk and not faint. We thank you for that strength today. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive Him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die but I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.